great. Have a seat, and we'll play back up there. Yeah. That was terrific. We'll, we'll have a chance to question Dr. Shulgin and the other uh, speakers when we sit down there in a little bit. Uh, you know, you weren't the only one experimenting with uh, psychedelic drugs in the 60s. I remember a friend of mine's father worked for the CIA, was telling me about a few CIA agents who walked out of a window on LSD, and this was 10 years before it was uncovered in congressional hearings. Um, our next guest, uh, Dr. Christopher Koch, Christoph Koch, excuse me, says his uh, aim in life is finding out how consciousness arises out of the brain. My long-term goal, he says, is to discover and characterize the neuronal correlates of consciousness, the NCC. I collaborated for 16 years in this exciting endeavor with the late Dr. Francis Crick at Salk, a postdoc refugee from MIT. Dr. Koch joined Caltech's newly started computation and neural systems option in 1986 as professor of computation and neural systems, running K-Lab as well as being the executive officer of CNS. Here to tell us more about his views of consciousness is Dr. Christoph Koch. Thank you. All right, so before we st uh, start, sort of I have to make a conceptual distinction because different people use consciousness in very different, uh, in very different ways. So first of all, there's uh, particularly what clinicians are interested in, there's the different states of conscious. consciousness. Right now, nobody's asleep, at least yet, so that's one state of conscious, you're, you're awake. Then, of course, there's, REM, there's different sorts of sleep, REM and slow wave sleep, there's coma, there's persistent vegetative syndrome, there's minimal conscious state, there's stupor, there are all these other states. And so you can study people, for example, you can try to make a contrast between the awake state and the REM, st uh, the REM state. So this sort of defines consciousness as such, the ability of your brain to, to be conscious at all. So right now we are, we are all conscious, but what most people who study this now are interested in is different states of consciousness. So while you're conscious, you can be conscious right now of my voice. I talk a little bit like my governor. And, um, <laughs> or, you, or you can be conscious of blue or, you know, of something else. So this is uh, the current content of consciousness. And... Um, the elements are called qualia. This is what philosophers uh, refer to. So there's a qualia for sound. There's a qual you have a qualia for red, for blue, for being angry, for being you, for you know being a late, you know, living in a late industrial, you know, post post construction society, whatever. Now, empirically, studying this aspect, as um, I can show you, is much much easier because this you can control very well in in humans and in some animals. You can control the level of arousal and then you can, you can manipulate the, the content, particularly in the, in the individual case. It's much more difficult to do this, for example, for, for self-consciousness. We don't have any good illusions. We don't have any good ways to manipulate self-consciousness. For example, I can sort of, without taking drugs, which is a little bit uncontrolled, I can't really, t uh, you know, switch my, my feeling of being Christoph on and off on a time scale of, of half a second. But I can do that perfectly well for, and for visual consciousness. And so here the trouble is if you do comparison between awake and REM or between REM and slow way or between coma and awake, as, as people do, there are all sorts of different things that change at the same time. It's not only, a t it's not only consciousness, it's also attention, it's also memory, it's also motor behavior. So it's, it's, um, it's more difficult to control experimentally. What is it we can say for sure at this point in 2005 about the neuronal colleagues of consciousness? Well, first of all, we know it's a property of certain complex adaptive networks, not all networks. So you may know down here in your gut you have roughly on the order of 100 million neurons, it's called the enteric nervous system, they're real neurons, they have synapses, a neurotransmitter, and for the most part, it's totally silent. You're not, a, you don't have conscious access to it, and if you do, usually it's bad what happens, right? Um, the other systems, like the, the, like the immune system, we don't have any conscious access to the immune system, so it's not just any, new, it's not just any cellular property, it's a property of particular neuronal networks. Um, uh, using ma a massive feedback, everybody believes without feedback, if you create, let's say, a mouse that has no feedback connection, this mouse wouldn't be conscious. Uh, it's, of course, shaped by, by, by evolution, by natural selection. Many species, certainly from a biological point of view, many species share aspects of consciousness with humans. That's not to say that the consciousness of a mouse, of a monkey, of a dog is the same as us. That's certainly not true. But uh, you can infer based on the very similar behavior, based on similar structure of the nervous system, and based on argument of evolutionary continuity, it is very likely that, let's say, a dog or a mouse or, um, or a monkey shares aspect like vision or like smelling, that also a mouse, when, it, when the mouse smells something, it also feels like something to, to the mouse to, sm to smell, you know, to smell something. We don't know 
right now the minimal, we have no idea about brain size, how brain size correlates with consciousness. We all have the strong feeling that, you know, things like C. elegans, like Drosophila, or like a bee, of course they're bugs, they're not conscious, but we really don't know. And if you observe, if you observe what a bee can do in, you know, conditional experiment in one shot learning, a bee has roughly a million neurons, it can do amazing feed of, of complex information processing, of complex visual pattern recognition, and you're not so sure anymore, non-reflexive behavior. So it's un so I'm not really totally sure anymore that it doesn't feel like something to be a bee. The trouble is we right now we don't really have good assays to test that. As uh, Eric uh, emphasized this morning, and of course as we know now through 100 years of psychophysics and clinical research and physiology, much if not most of behavior occurs without consciousness, occurs either totally bypassing consciousness or consciousness comes after the fact, like giving a talk like this. Right? Most of us, when we talk, we have no idea what we're going to say. Right? You hear these words coming out of my mouth. The only thing I know is sort of at the ne in the next two minutes, I, I want to you know, make this point, I want to make that point, but it's not that I'm consciously, Christoph is sitting inside here, formulating a sentence, putting the verb and the noun together, translating it from, English, from German into English, and then sending it out to my, to my, uh, you know, to, to my learnings. It all happens unconsciously. And we know this for sensory motor behaviors, for, for visual behaviors. There's lots of evidence for that. So this really gives rise to a, a contrastive strategy because you can now contrast at the level of brain architecture where's the difference between those behaviors, let's say in humans or in monkeys, that give rise to conscious sensation versus those behaviors that do not give rise to conscious, to conscious sensation. Is it different brain areas? Are there some brain areas, let's say, down in the brain, in the catacombs of the, of the brain, of cortex, let's say, in the basal ganglia on the, on the, in the, in the pons, in the midbrain? Do they never, are they never associated with consciousness? It used to be, for example, believed in the 19th century, most uh, throughout the 20th century, that anything in cortex, if you, have new, if you have vigorous neural activity in cortex, that's always associated with consciousness. We know that's certainly not true, for example, through experiments of Nikos Logotitis in the monkey. You can have neurons that fire very, very vigorously to a, to a, to a visual stimulus. However, if, it, if the animal does not perceive it because it's perceptual suppressed, the animal isn't, it doesn't respond to it, the animal doesn't seem to be aware of it, yet you have lots of neurons, for example, in visual cortex that fire to it. So that means just because you have some cortical neurons that fire vigorously, it does not equate with the fact that those neurons, their representational content is made accessible to consciousness. So what Francis Crick and I have advocated since many, many years, and what people are doing now, is look for the minimal neuronal mechanisms that are jointly sufficient for any one conscious percept. Minimal because we know the entire brain is sufficient, but we, for example, in order to in order for you to see this blue. Do you need your cerebellum? Well, probably not. Do you need your retina? Probably not, because you can close your eyes and you can imagine the, uh, the, the blue. Do you need your primary visual cortex? Well, that's much more controversial already. But, all right. So this brings me to my next point. <laughs> yes. Because, so, it, you know, when I talk, for example, in philosophy's department, people ask me, well, how can you study consciousness without properly defining it? Now, of course, historically, as we all know, in science, progress almost always happens at the time when we don't have good definitions. And defining something too early is usually, you know, if you define it too prematurely, you know, it can be a bad thing. So here, this is what I mean by consciously. Well, what you should do now, fixate this uh, cause. Just look at this cause here. Look at it very intent. Don't close your eyes. Don't move your eyes. And then what do you see? It's called um, motion-induced blindness. Okay, do, do, do some of you see this? So, get, so look at the cause, and what you should see is that one or both of the yellow squares sometimes disappear. All right? You see this? Okay, so here, so, you know, people, uh, so he, so this sort of is an operational definition of consciousness. When you're conscious of the yellow, you see it. You have sensations, you can see the yellow, it may remind you of, you know, the yellow sunflower of Van Gogh or yellow sun or whatever. And when, when you don't see it, it's just not there. We, we're not conscious of it. But f physically, the, phys the stimulus is all the time present.